Hello, welcome. My name is Brennan Blanco. Hi, this is Yun Song Lu from Huawei. Hi, and today we're here to talk about um, how, uh, how we've been leveraging XDP and how you can do so as well to, um, to do programmable high performance uh, data paths for OpenStack and how you can use that. So, oops. Um, Sure. <laughs> uh, so we just want to uh, give a short um, uh, thanks to our sponsoring members. So uh, we're both part of the iAvisor project. And uh, iAvisor project, it's a Linux Foundation collaborative project um, for uh, enabling people to, you, to do I.O. Um, and uh, that's... Um, so today... We're going to give a little bit of background to iAvisor, um, and then we're going to uh, focus on one, one application um, called XDP, uh, and we'll give a, a bit of use case. Sure. And so <laughs> iAvisor Project is a, it's a community and a set of tools developed by that community uh, for doing um, a various uh, set of things for uh, high performance IO. So from tracing and security um, to networking. And the, the goal is to, to uh, use these tools to develop new infrastructure applications. So we started by building uh, networking applications. It's one of the original use cases uh, for software defined networking. And we want uh, we wanted an SDK to extend this low-level infrastructure um, thing for like processing packets and, and things like that. Um, but we didn't want to have everyone need to become a kernel developer to do that, um, which is kind of the status quo within Linux. Um, and even, even outside of Linux, you have to be pretty low-level um, to, to be able to develop new networking applications or I.O. applications in general. So um, we kind of looked around and looked at different application frameworks that were successful um, to kind of look for, for guidance in, in how to build a new framework. So take, for instance, Node.js. I'm actually not a Node.js expert, so it might be a horrible example. Um, but it seems, seems to have some, some popularity. And why? Well, it starts by uh, realizing that writing multi-threaded applications is hard. Um, it's very confusing. Um, and Node.js has, uh, has this uh, different approach that, um, that doesn't match up with the CPU architecture. Rather, it looks at the, the way that events happen um, in, in those applications and try to, to enable a syntax that, that is uh, more suitable. But it does that without sacrificing performance. You can write in this expressive language, but um, V8, the compiler, uh, has a nice translation into to native code. Um, and you have this uh, community that, that publishes all of their applications. Um, it's easy to, to install and so on. And so there's lots of sharing and, and a, a rapid cycle of development. So let's apply that analogy to infrastructure applications. It's a little, it's a little bit different. You have a, lot, uh, a different set of restrictions um, and goals. So you, you want high performance access to data. Uh, so um, that's why a lot of the things are in kernel or in um, user space frameworks. Um, it has to be reliable. You're, you're building thing, applications for high uptime. Um, so it, it can't crash. It can't be um, you know, working some of the time. Um, and you need to be able to uh, uh, to, again, have this high uptime, um, besides not, just not crashing, even your development model needs to uh, avoid having to reboot your server. Um, and uh, we want something that's, um, uh, that's, that's not, you know, doesn't, again, doesn't, doesn't require uh, mucking around with your, your kernel um, that you can write as if it's a normal application, um, but still having, like, you know, those first couple points of, you know, access to data. And, a programming language abstraction to go along with that. It should be easy to write. You don't, um, let's, let's, we've learned a lot of things over the past couple of decades. Let's be modern about how we're writing these, these applications. 
so um, here's something that, that a tool that's um, that's been around for a little while um, that we recent that as part of the the community effort we were able to um, extend uh, so BPF programs are um, well, they're not really programs. I'll get to that in a moment. But it's a um, kind of a, an instruction set for uh, for low-level, initially packet parsing, um, but it's actually a little more generic than that. Um, and with an iAvisor, you can take these BPF programs and uh, attach them to events within the kernel, and um, you get a few uh, your data structures that you can access to. You get events, um, kernel events, packet events, I/O events that you can um, match up with your, your BPF program. And you also get a, a user space library and a set of system calls to interact with that, um, that low level um, primitive. Um, and so B BPF is, is this um, tool inside Linux um, that's been around for uh, several decades. Uh, and again, it's not really a, a program, we call it they call them BPF programs, but um, there's no process ID. It's kind of running off to the side um, in the kernel or, or even in, in other hardware um, where it supports BPF. And um, uh, most importantly, what, what makes this a, kind of a really killer application is that um, you can take these programs, run them in the kernel in the native instructions of that machine, um, even though it's, uh, it's kind of a, it looks like an, an, um, a high level language. Um, and it's not a kernel module. It's not like binary that you're loading into the kernel, uh, sort of. Um, but it does run very quickly. It runs in the, the native instruction set. So there's a JIT inside of the kernel that translates these programs to native instructions. And so that's a little bit of background of what iVisor comprises. And um, now I'd, I'd ask Yansung to talk a little bit about what XTP is. Okay. Um, actually, a little bit background about XDP. Um, before that, actually, networking has been the major use case of IO weather from day one. Actually, we know that Plum, Plum Grid has their uh, SDN solution built on IO weather technology. Uh, Cisco has Cilium uh, solution built on uh, IO weather technology. Huawei has its uh, micro data plan container technology built on IO weather. All those things are using IO weather technologies and some uh, in-kernel uh, um, tools, IO weather tools to build networking. XDP was proposed in early this year at uh, the networking, uh, Linux Net Dive 1.1 conference. At that time, people were talking about how to improve in networking for Linux. XDP was proposed. Yeah, the SDP design, um, we had, uh, there, there were several goals um, on mind, right? Firstly, it must be high performance because uh, the Linux solution on Linux and for OpenStack, for whatever other uh, environment has been criticized for its bad performance. Uh, may, you may have suffered some low performance of the networking solutions. So also, as Brandon has talked about, the programmability is also very important. You want to write some new application very easily, and you don't want to really change your kernel that often. Um, also, um, SDP really doesn't replace the current TCP IP stack. It's an uh, add-on to the uh, new stack. It's fully integrated, and it's augment the current stack and the kernel to do better work. Um, of course, XDP is designed to run on general purpose hardware. It can be running on x86, ARM, and of course some NPs. Uh, also, we mentioned that the acceleration. Because for other stack and other technologies were designed purely as a software, then later try to add some offloading and acceleration things. But with SDP, the offloading acceleration concepts was uh, taken into consideration from day one. That's the design purpose. So look at this. Simply, there were uh, uh, three places to run XDP data plan. Basically, look at from uh, bottom up, we can see hardware. 
we, there is a kernel then user space, right? And the XDP natively is implemented in kernel. Actually, uh, as we, uh, we'll show some demo and some more detailed uh, packet flow in kernel shortly. And also, look at the uh, app, there are some use cases. V switch, V router, firewall, load balancer, those things, you can write those uh, applications, those functions in C, P4, or some other language you prefer. It's fairly easy. Um, shortly in the demo, we'll also show how, to, how you can quickly update your program and load it to the uh, uh, VM. Okay, firstly, uh, I want to, uh, we want to really clarify the terms, right? IOVisor and XDP. IOVisor is a framework, the platform with, uh, as a community. The, it includes BPF tools and a lot of things, many use cases. SDP is for networking, particularly for uh, Linux, for solutions. You can build a, uh, the network functions based on XDP. Okay, uh, uh, again, look at the use cases, right? Uh, you can rebuild the virtual switch easily with XDP technology, of course, um, with IOVisor tools. Uh, v router. Uh, actually, today there is a router um, which has been deployed in Facebook. They have, they have implemented their uh, new IRA router uh, for, uh, with XDP for their, their data center. Uh, load balancer as well, right? Easily, if you, have, you need to do the application load balancing, uh, SDP is really a, um, a perfect technology for that. Security. Security is something very uh, interesting. Um, you are, uh, do people do use firewall for OpenStack for a lot of applications? Of course, we know a famous thing happened recently. We'll talk about a little bit later. So also, we are building not only with SDP, we are not only building some small blocks, right? Those building blocks are good, virtual switch, virtual router, those things. We are also building, in the community, uh, we are also building some solutions. Um, one thing is uh, that will be announced soon, will be an OVN, accelerated OVN solution. When OVN gets announced, there will be talk. Please uh, follow up the OVN development and some the SDP development from iOweather.org and some other websites. Of course, there will be solutions particularly designed for container networking. Uh, um, there are already some names there. Uh, you will see more. Okay, this is the in-kernel data pass. We talked about the SDP can run in-kernel, can also be able to, you can also can port it, uh, it to hardware also can be running in user space, right? Uh, this is the in kernel, how, how it run in kernel. I would give the stage back to Brandon to talk about more details, then it will be followed by a demo. Thank you. Thank you. So um, here we see a, a bit the, uh, the, the placement of, or a little bit of layout of um, existing Linux kernel stacks, so the kind of the things on the right. You have drivers um, uh, managing the, the device, uh, uh, the device state on the bottom, um, getting uh, data in and out of those, passing that uh, eventually up to um, usually the TCP stack sockets, your applications. Um, and the way the way, place that XDP f fits is uh, right at the very bottom layer, um, before even the the drivers have handed off. The, the packets um, to the stacks for, for the application processing. Um, and the, the reason that we do this is that the, um, that processing, um, if you want to run fast, you have to uh, put your, the, the fast processing before any extra work has been done. Um, and as the drivers are, are receiving packets from, from the network, um, you'll, you'll be passing these off to these customizable, programmable units of, of BPF programs. Um, that can then have some actions that they'll pass upwards, either maybe to drop the packet, the story ends there, um, or you can receive, uh, receive upwards and influence um, some of the Linux uh, behavior, such as um, packet steering, so to, to hash your packet to um, different applications or, or cores or Numa nodes. 
um, GRO for doing uh, packet coalescing uh, or forwarding if you want to you know, let the XDP application be the, uh, be the entirety of your application. If you're, just, if you're building one of these um, applications like you know, vRouter, vSwitch, load balancer, um, the packet might just immediately go back out on the network, maybe with some modification um, or with some, some bookkeeping that, that you do. Um, and if you remember back to um, a previous slide where we had the, some APIs between user space and kernel space, those are also available here as well. So the BPF um, event model um, applies, applies here as well, and you get uh, system calls, uh, ability to access the, the map data um, that you keep in your program. So you can build a, a, a functional model out of this. Um, and so now getting to a use case. Does anyone know what this graph signifies? There are some hints already, but can anyone see the date on that? Yeah, this, this happened Friday. Uh, this is um, a graph of the um, packets received uh, over time, so the packets per second, uh, on the level three network um, that was front ending the traffic to the Dyne, uh, DyneNet, the DNS um, service. And um, you know, with all of the, the compromised, uh, uh, whatever was it, the cameras and routers and so on out in the internet, they were flooding the, uh, the Dyne servers with DNS traffic with SYN packets and, and various other attacks. Um, it you know, brought Twitter to a halt, for instance. Oh no. Um, so a DDoS attack is one example of um, a use case where you need fast networking. So consider this, this attack. Um, and it had a, a fluctuating mix. You saw like the graph had a couple waves. Um, within those waves, uh, some of the analysis has shown that there are like different types of attacks that were coming and going on you know, SYN packets, uh, uh, DNS, uh, like a spam of DNS attack uh, requests. Um, and to be able to defend against that high rate, like you know, um, many, many gigabits uh, spread across you know, multiple servers, um, the, you have to be able to do as fast as you can filtering of traffic. You can't uh, afford any s cycles to, to, um, to you know, go and do some, some slow analysis. Um, otherwise, your good traffic is completely lost. It's going to be in some buffer somewhere. It's going to be tail dropped. You're never going to, to see, um, see any of the traffic to be able to even pass it along to the next host. Um, and so as we're defending against this, we need to be able to adapt just as quickly. Um, and so we need a very flexible model for that. And you need tools that are, that are very, very nimble. So um, we have, and we're actually working on this before this attack, so it's just coincidental, um, that to, to defend against a, a DDoS, um, we, we're trying to see, just to start with, how fast can we drop packets? That's, that's really what a, a DDoS mitigation is, is just dropping as fast as you can. Um, so we have just a simple setup that I'll show in a second, um, where we have uh, uh, two, two x86 boxes. Um, the machine on the right is, is our uh, sender. It's just going to um, send on a 40 gig uh, NIC uh, UDP, uh, you know, small frame size um, as fast as it can. And I'm going to start the, the setup with an open stack on the left-hand side. So just simple dev stack, OVS uh, bridge router, a uh, couple VMs with uh, floating IPs. And we're going to send, uh, send traffic to that, see what happens. So here we have our dev stack set up. We have um, a couple instances there. Um, IPs really aren't important, so let's keep the screen small. Um, our network topology has, um, like we said, there's a private network, a router, a public network. The public network here is what's connected to the, the Mellanox card on the, on the receiver side. Um, so it's just doing a you know, simple floating IP translation there. And um, let's start with, let's see how we'll measure uh, our good traffic. Very, very simple. We'll just send uh, 50 pings um, over a short period of time and expect, there we go, zero packets lost. Good. And here we're going to be monitoring our, 
receiver to um, see the packets that are being received. Um, we'll get a kind of a, a meter here on the right, and the CPU load. So we'll start that off. And let's see, give it a few seconds to ramp up. Our CPU is already at 100%. And our rate that we're measuring that OVS is being able, so keep it, remember we're, I'm here we're sending still to the VMs. So the VMs are being able to handle about, you know, 430, thousand packets per second. Um, and I haven't really tuned um, OBS here, so you're, you may get different numbers in your performance deskbed. That's not the point here. Because it's definitely not going to be able to keep up with that, uh, that line rate to small packet size, no matter what we do. So let's do, let me stop this. Let's do something simple, and we'll check our, uh, our access group rules. And yeah, so we were allowing UDP traffic, so our packets were reaching to the VM. That's definitely not going to perform well. Let's make sure that at least um, before reaching to the VMs that our host is dropping those. So let's try again. Forgot to check to see if we could actually ping. We wouldn't have been able to ping. Here we'll um, let's see what we can do. Doesn't look good. 86% packet loss. And um, we were doing about 440 before. Now we're doing about 480K. And our CPU is at 100%, not leaving a lot of room for, for the good traffic. OK. So um, we've done most of what we can using the standard OpenStack tools. Uh, now we're going to um, use XDP to add a filter for UDP traffic. So let's just take a quick look at that, uh, the script we have. It's using iAvisor tools. So we have um, a set of Python. We can make this a little bigger. A Python script here, which takes a few command line arguments. And we have um, a simple parser that uh, can parse IP headers. And it's just going to um, return one to our caller uh, whenever we see uh, 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 UDP packets, um, and our, our program here is just going to we'll call that parse function, and it's going to return drop uh, whenever it gets the, the positive value, and it's going to keep a statistic. So we'll just run that. And we'll start up our traffic. And let's see that ramp. So we'll notice right away that our CPU utilization is no longer at 100%. We're now sitting here hovering around 20% uh, CPU, and we're dropping 20 million packets per second. Um, and that's, that's actually pretty good. Um, so uh, there are some uh, NICs out there, some, um, uh, some hardware that can do um, rates like this. Um, you can do drops in hardware without doing much processing at rates like this, but to actually have programmability um, and then uh, getting these up into Linux and, and then taking action in Linux is, um, is pretty novel. Um, so let's go one more step. So let's update this on the fly. Um, let's show you how easy it is to, uh, to adapt this script to, to the attack. So I'm going to, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this script, and I'm going to add a, a hash table where I'm going to keep a, a blacklist of IP addresses. So we'll add, we'll keep uh, UN32 for our IP address, just an int for our result, call it blacklist. 1,000 entries. I can tune this as I want. We'll write the parsing code here. So if we see, um, so we'll, um, if the destination is one of those four floating IPs that we have, uh, we're going to um, drop this. So first we'll, uh, first we'll extract the IP address from the packet. And if uh, we don't find a result, 
Um, we're not going to bother trying to, to drop it. We'll, we'll let it pass. So if, um, if this IP address is not in our blacklist, um, we'll return 0. And now we'll add a little bit of Python code to, um, to inject this. So we'll get a handle for our table. And we'll just take out this old code. Um, and we'll do um, we'll let our uh, our user uh, give the list of IP addresses and feed that into our blacklist. So we'll say. And so if you're curious in the syntax of this, these are all on our GitHub. Um, so. We'll just update the table whenever I type in here. So we'll start that up. And we'll start up our traffic. So I haven't put any IP addresses into the blacklist yet. So I expect our, um, we'll still be, uh, until we get the, the list populated. So we'll add one, Let's see what happens. So we're, now we're dropping one of the four IP addresses. Mm, not there yet. I have to get all four of them. And there we are again. And so we can, uh, that's our, that's our uh, DDoS tool. Very simple, and I'm sure it's uh, not, uh, <laughs> not really going to protect against uh, a botnet out there, but uh, it's a start. So something you guys can use, go to the, the GitHub and, and play around. And there we are. Um, we have a microphone here, so I'm going to ask uh, Fouad to carry this around. If anyone has any questions? Any questions? Yeah, we have one. Good. Uh, just to be sure, uh, the uh, packets are still uh, handled with interrupts. This is not the case in DBDK. Right. So, uh, but it's impressive because we still get uh, very high performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is this will hook into um, the, however the drivers are are written that support XDP. Um, for instance, in the Mellanox one, they they can run in polling mode or in a nappy interrupt mode, um, and it's you know depending on how the application is using those drivers, it can it can adapt. But the XDP hook is supported for both. And again, just to make sure, because it's so impressive, is the drop done in the hardware, in the NIC, or in the kernel? In the kernel. So the, the, um, so I guess one caveat is that this setup has DDIO um, from the Mellanox NIC to the CPU, but the, the packets are, are get, making it all the way to the CPU, for sure. And so this, uh, this program has, let's see, um, I think it had three packet accesses, so it was doing at least three reads from the from the packet, which should have been uh, warm in the cache, uh, as well as keeping a couple statistics. So it was keeping one statistic and looking at, looking up in a hash table. And a different question: um, you uh, you show that the. Uh, the packet is uh, first handed to the XDP uh, component and then is uh, sent to the stack. Is there a double parsing in this case? Um, there could be for those, yeah. Um, the overhead of, these, uh, of this parsing, though, is, uh, is going to be, um, well, think of it this way. Uh, if you want to handle uh, um, line rate traffic, 
you'll, let's say on a, at a 40 gig NIC, you'll, you have about 16 nanoseconds per packet. So if, on, a 30, on a three gigahertz, um, that's 50 cycles, if I remember cor correctly. So you have about 50 cycles uh, if you want to handle line rate traffic. Doing, doing a, an allocation of um, an SK buff uh, and just getting into the stack at all uh, blows that budget. Um, so in the, in the good case, um, you might be adding a little bit of overhead, but it's not going to be more than, than, uh, than 50, maybe 50 cycles or so. That's how fast some of these are going. And we have, and you saw we have uh, cycles to burn as well. And that's just one core. Uh, hello. Uh, you mentioned that Facebook has built a, a switch uh, using this technology. Uh, I was just wondering that uh, what's the advantage of, uh, uh, to build the switch using this one and comparing to the normal uh, OS? Uh, actually, we what we mentioned, I mentioned is yes. yeah. router. It's a IOA router. It's an IPv6 router built by yeah. uh, Facebook. They are using it in their data center today. So I guess yeah, I mean not that, it's, then, it's a different router than what's available in like Linux, say. It, it uses different primitives. So they're able to program a completely new use case on top of, uh, you know, on top of IOWizer and BPF and then uh, run it in XDP so it's fast. Like that's that's like if they had to do it within the kernel itself, they would. Uh, and I think they, they have been doing some of this, um, but they're able to do the the BPF based one much faster. You can just you know code up in, in these files the the parsing logic and not have to submit kernel patches. And um, because it is it is new functionality but in the ILA router case, it doesn't exist yet. Right. Also, back to the vSwitchers part, right? The current thing, the performance actually is burned in kernel by driver, by packet processing, by a lot of things. With this, the things can be done much earlier. Then you have much higher packet rate uh, from lower level of the driver. You see the 20 million packet per second processing. So if you can process from there for virtual switching, you can get much better performance. We actually, we saw, we got a very impressive virtual switch performance numbers, but uh, just not, we, we are not going to go too deep in that topic today. Yeah, I guess the answer, the answer there is join the community and come code with us. Sure. Uh, can you elaborate on the, the last bullet, that uh, Docker Kubernetes container? No, 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 no. on this slide. <laughs> you, you, no, this one. Yeah, that, that one, yeah, the last, the last one. bullet. So what's the state of the, the, um, the container well, networking? First of all, what are you, you are doing there? And then what's the kind of status? Um, actually, there are several things going on today. But the thing is something, uh, so some work hasn't um, been fully announced. Uh, actually, you can see there is a Selenium product by, done by Cisco, which is using the technology we are talking about here. and. Uh, um, also, there are some other solutions out there people are working on, but uh, maybe you can go to the community to look at those things, yeah. what's I, going on. I don't have all the details. I, I know about Cilium. I don't know about the others. So there's... Because yeah. some solutions haven't been fully yeah. announced. It's, it's still growing, so not, uh, not solved yet. Also coming soon. I guess. Also coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> because it's the open source part. But by the way, uh, uh, many vendors, many companies are working on their own solutions, right? This is talking about the open source part, the community part. Uh, are you aware of a uh, vendor uh, wanting to support eBPF in hardware? I believe there are some in the room. Yeah, actually. <laughs> so can you give anyway, a status of uh, our roadmap? There you go. Uh, so Netronome has an uh, offload for BPF. It's not hooked up to XDP yet, but it will be soon. And so currently you can use it through the EB, uh, TC. Um, and uh, basically the way that it works is uh, we JIT the code 
the eBPF in the kernel and then push that down to the hardware that we have, which uh, then runs the, the jitted code. Um, the major feature that we're missing apart from XDP support at this time is support for eBPF maps, which is the facility Brendan used to dynamically update uh, w uh, which packets are being dropped, but we're also working on that and we expect to make progress very soon. And uh, the, the basic uh, offload for the, the TC is already in the main line kernel. Yeah, also there are, there are some other names. You see Barefoot is working on put XDP on their switch hardware. Also FPGA, Network on Broadcom, all those things can be done. Some work, are, has, uh, some work has been done, some are still in progress. Uh, to be clear, XDP, actually the BPF is a, fair, is a virtual machine, right? For the dumb NIC, the, 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 the traditional very simple NIC, you cannot run BPF on the hardware. Virtual it, machine in the sense of like a Java virtual machine. Oh yeah, like a time, Java a virtual machine, <laughs> not uh, like the VA, uh, virtual machine for open stack. It's an internal virtual machine, the instruction level virtual machine. Yeah. So you need some new hardware, we call it accelerator, to, to, to run that. Of course, with P FPGA multi-core uh, processors, it's much easier to do such work. Okay. Thank you very much. If you have any further Thank questions. Thank you. Yep.